This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. Hey there, and welcome to episode number 21 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. My name is Brian Wells. I'm coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York, And thank you once again for taking time out of your schedule to join us on the Homestead Journey. I certainly appreciate you stopping by. If you are new to this podcast, welcome. If you have been listening for a while, welcome back. And thank you again for being a part of the journey. This week in upstate New York, it is just, it seems like spring is here and yet I am not sure whether or not I want to um, accept that fact. Uh, Not because I don't want it to be spring, but because as they say, in like a lion, out like a lamb, in like a lamb, out like a lion. Well, March certainly came in like a lamb and so I've kind of been waiting for the other shoe to drop but we have had some nice weather this past week we had some rain um, just typical spring conditions outside working uh, at some points in just a light jacket or my vest Um, it's just been absolutely beautiful here and looking forward to a beautiful spring obviously the big news um, is COVID-19 and all of that that's going on and so We did uh, take a run to the store this week uh, just for a few simple items. Uh, Didn't need to stock up on toilet paper, although I did buy some, but uh, that was just more because we were starting to run low. Um, But it's just amazing to me, folks, uh, that of all the things, (laughs) of all the things, um, people are making a run on toilet paper. Now, Folks, not to be crass here, but um, we have, uh, depending on what philosophy you ascribe to, we have been around either for thousands or millions of years, and people have pooped for thousands or millions of years, and toilet paper is a relatively new invention. And uh, we we did fine um, without, the, now I love my TP, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not a bidet guy. And maybe this is too much information, but I'm not a bidet guy. Um, I I do like my, uh, you know, Charmin, um, you know, three-ply or whatever it is, you know, kind of that uh, soft, uh, you know, enjoy-the-go kind of a situation. But, folks, the insanity over TP is just absolutely mind-blowing. Um, but anyhow, that's the world in which we live, and I don't really want to spend a whole lot of time on uh, on this coronavirus thing, but it's hard to ignore it because it has been absolutely bananas. And uh, so hopefully you are well, and uh, you're well physically, um, and you're in a good mental state of mind. Um, I want to encourage you. Uh, both from the standpoint of the journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability, because that is um, kind of the heartbeat of this of this podcast. But uh, I also want to serve as an encouragement to you as an individual, as a person, um, that uh, you know we're going to make it through this situation, and um, hopefully people will kind of wake up to um, maybe being. Uh, the need to be uh, a little bit better prepared and to live lives that are more self-sufficient, self-reliant, and sustainable. That is my hope. Anyhow, let's jump right into this week's Homestead Happenings. This week on the Homestead, a big part of my week was spent finishing up our chicken coop. So if you follow us on Facebook or Instagram, you'll have seen the pictures of uh, me wrapping up the mobile coop. It's probably about 95% of the way done. Well, maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration because I still do need to paint it and I do need to put up a little bit of trim and put down the rubberized flooring. Um, But we are really at a great place. The chicks don't come for about another 10 days, 10 or 11 days. 
Um, and so I'm very, very happy where, where we're at. And uh, hopefully um, I'll be able to get those other, you know, nitpicky things done. I, I'm not planning on painting it before um, they get here. In fact, I'm probably not going to paint it until the summer. And the reason is the trim that I got is um, it is pressure treated and it was still very, very wet. And so what I want to do is just allow it to dry out so that hopefully it will take the paint better. Now the siding that I used is pre-finished and uh, so I think it'll be fine without having it get painted uh, right away. Uh, but I did use some tin that I got down at my grand, um, at my grand, well my used to be my grandfather's house and kind of a complicated thing. Now my aunt owns half of it and half of it that was my grandfather's house got sold and kind of a complicated situation. But anyhow, there was some tin down there that came off my aunt's roof and uh, my grandfather kind of squirreled it away. And so I went and got that and used that on the chicken coop. Now it's not exactly the color that I would have probably chose. It's a blue. Uh, my wife and son aren't that thrilled with it, but it saved me a whole heck of a lot of green. And I love that. Uh, and so we have a blue roof. So I figure if I paint the coop red and I trim it out with white, I will have an all American mobile chicken coop. Uh, and uh, so that's what I am going for. Um, some other things that took place on the homestead this week is that darn pig kept getting out. She got out several times this week. And uh, so today I, I finally buckled down and said, okay, I'm going to address the broken, um, the, the broken wire for the electric fence uh, because it had kind of come loose. And uh, so, okay, I, I think that's where she, she's getting out. And so I actually ran to Tractor Supply to get some clips and uh, ran a new piece of wire and uh, was in the process of putting all that together uh, when I realized that she was not getting out underneath the fence. In fact, what she was doing is uh, she the, our shed kind of butts up against the the yard, the, the paddock that she and the boar are in. And uh, I had put some plywood across the back of that shed um, because the shed is raised up at that point there, the way the, the, the ground slopes off, there's probably about a two and a half foot, uh, maybe three foot uh, drop there. Um, so the shed is, is, is kind of raised up off the ground that far. And then I had put some uh, plywood across there. And there was one section that I had used, I had scabbed in a piece of uh, siding from my fixed chicken coop. And what I found is she had broken through that and she was actually crawling underneath the shed and she must have been down on her knees coming through there um, and then and then kind of breaking out through that way. And so once I saw that, I said, ah, you little beggar, I got you now. And uh, so I cut a piece of plywood and, uh, and put it in place and next thing I know she was banging up against it, but uh, I made sure to reinforce it with a two by six. And so hopefully she is going to stay where she's supposed to be. Um, because today she made a beeline for the garage with the garage door open. And actually in the, the one part of the garage, we keep some chicken feed and she made a beeline for that. And so I grabbed her by her hind leg and I'm pulling her back and she's squealing and I'm hollering to my son, close the door, close the door, close the door. And so we finally got the door closed and I got her to, you know, I let her go and went and got some sprouted or the spent grain that I get from the brewery. And uh, it took a little while to get her interested in that because there was some chicken feed that had spilled in the driveway um, in all of the wrestling around because she actually got into a bucket that we had some chicken feed in and knocked it over. So she was trying to get at that and she really wasn't interested in the sprouted grain or not the sprouted grain, the spent grain. And, but eventually I was able to get her interested in that and she chased me down the hill. And so I was, I was act actually at this point on my way to tractor supply. So I said to my son, just keep an eye on her and sure as shooting while I was gone, she got back out. And uh, that's when I discovered how she was getting out. At that point, I had thought she was going through the electric fence or where the electric fence was supposed to be. So the other thing I did was I bought 
a bigger electric fence charger. I had one that was rated for, I think, 10 acres, which means that it doesn't put out quite as much heat and it was a continuous flow. So I, I got one that um, is rated for, I think, 30 miles and uh, puts out a little bit more of a jolt. And uh, both when she and the boar hit that uh, with their noses, <laughs> they yipped. And uh, I think they will stay where they're supposed to be. At least hopefully that is the case. Finally, uh, as I was feeding the pigs this morning, I was kind of thinking about, well, all of the stuff that's going on currently with uh, the coronavirus and a lot of the things that uh, I am involved in are either being canceled or postponed. So um, my schedule really is getting ready to, to open up quite a bit. Now, I certainly don't say this braggadociously, but there are times when I will go several weeks in a row and have a meeting or an event uh, every night of the week between uh, things I'm involved in with church and with my son's Boy Scout troop and just some other things that I have going on in the community. Um, I, I'm very, very busy. And with all of this coronavirus, I, again, this, this morning as I'm feeding the pigs, uh, thinking with all of these things being canceled, I am going to have a lot of time to get a bunch of stuff done here on the homestead. And I started looking around and thinking, there's a lot of stuff around here that I'm always saying, I'd really like to get to it, and I never do, because I blame it on being too busy. Well, now is the time. And my recommendation to you, yes, this whole situation um, is affecting and upending our lives, that there is no doubt. But let's use it as an opportunity as homesteaders to kind of lean into our homesteading lifestyle. And you, if you are like me and you're having some evenings free up, some weekends free up because of this, um, use that to your advantage. Uh, I This coming weekend, I was very, very excited. I had a charcuterie class scheduled uh, over in New Hampshire, and I was just really looking forward to that. And they postponed it. And I was really bummed. I, I got to be honest with you. I was really looking forward to that class. Um, I, I think they made the, the right decision. Um, but I was, I was bummed. But now I'm thinking, well, I've got a weekend now that I, I wouldn't have been able to get anything done here on the homestand. Man, that's a lot of stuff I can get done this coming weekend. So I'm going to do my best not to sit on my butt and watch YouTube videos, but I'm going to do my best to get out there and really get some things done that uh, I normally don't get to because I blame it on being busy. And quite frankly, it maybe sometimes I use being busy as an excuse, but it really is the fact. Um, I think many of us live um, very busy lives, especially if we have kids that are involved in any kinds of activities whatsoever. And so you may find yourself and probably are finding yourself in the same boat as I am with a little bit of extra time on your hands. Now is the time. Now is the time for us to really put our noses to the grindstone. And there's a lot of stuff we can do, folks. Maybe you're a little worried about, you know, income and all of those kinds of things, and I totally get that. There's a lot of uncertainty out there right now. But there are a lot of things that we can do on our homesteads that don't cost us a dime. They just need a little bit of elbow grease, right? A little bit of us putting our back into it. And uh, so those are the kinds of things that that's my goal to try to tackle some of those things that I normally wouldn't get to because I say I'm too busy. And uh, so we'll see how things go. I will report back to you next week how well that plan, <laughs> I was able to action that plan. But that is my goal this week is to try to look at the situation as maybe a little bit of the glass being half full instead of the glass being half empty. Now, I'm not saying that cavalierly. I understand that this is affecting people's lives um, in a major way. Please don't get me wrong. But on the other hand, we can sit around and, and, and complain about it, um, or we can kind of try to see the silver line in the cloud. And so that's what I'm trying to do, and that's what I'm suggesting that you do as well on your homestead. All right, let's jump on over to this week's Charting the Course. On this episode, we're going to spend some time talking about homestead 
preparedness. Now, again, obviously, I am recording this in March of 2020, and the big news uh, all over everywhere is the coronavirus. And it is impacting our way of life in a very, very major way. Now, this show is not going to be a show about the virus for several reasons. First, I am not a qualified medical professional of any sort, uh, let alone in the area of infectious diseases, and I certainly don't play one on TV. <laughs> and uh, so I'm not going to act like I play one on uh, on this podcast. It is amazing uh, how many people have become infectious disease experts on my Facebook page, uh, on my Facebook feed, I guess I should say, but uh, I certainly am not someone who has that level of expertise. And so I simply am not going to try to speak to it from that perspective. Secondly, quite frankly, I, I am really no longer quite sure what information to trust and what information is simply more media hype. And whether it's media hype or people on Facebook who are running into a store and taking pictures of empty shelves and shrilly saying, you know, go get money out of the uh, out of the ATM. The end is near. Apocalypse is upon us. Um, but quite frankly, I just am not sure what information to trust and what information is hype. And I've I've just I've given up trying. I'm trying to do my best. Um, but, uh, I certainly have no way to speak to that in a way, um, that I would have any confidence in communicating that to you. Finally, quite frankly, I am tired of the topic and I'd really like to talk to, uh, about something else. Um, and that's not to say that I want to minimize it. Or I'm trying to stick my head in the sand, but I really don't want to do 30 minutes of talking about coronavirus. And finally, I, I think I already said finally, but uh, I'll say one more thing, and that is that this podcast, my goal for this podcast is not necessarily to speak to current events. Now, obviously, I'm going to do that. I have done that. But my goal for this podcast is really to, to see things from a broader perspective. And, uh, you know, I want this, this podcast to be as helpful five years from now, or at least that's my goal, that's my hope. It's as helpful five years from now as it is tomorrow or five days from now. Um, but all of that being said, I think this situation has really gotten me to thinking, just like it's gotten most people, and, and my guess is most people who are listening to this podcast have been thinking, uh, just like I have, how well are we prepared to handle emergency situations, whether they're global pandemics, they're national emergencies, or they're more localized um, weather-related uh, catastrophic events like tornadoes and snowstorms and those kinds of things. Now, I certainly have never considered myself to be a prepper. A part of the reason is that there are some people who identify with that lifestyle who hold some conspiratorial ideas and really what I consider to be relatively extremist beliefs that I simply don't adhere to. And again, I'm not trying to cast judgment, That's just, but it's just the fact of the, mat the matter. I don't identify with, with those perspectives. But another part of the reason why I, I've never considered myself a prepper is that there simply is a certain stigma that comes with that name that I honestly don't want to be associated with. In particular, because that stigma is rooted in the belief and ideas I mentioned earlier that I don't necessarily espouse. But one thing is for sure, I think people are looking at preppers a bit differently today than they were a couple of weeks ago. In fact, I have one particular friend who's a, a great guy. I love him to death, but he's rather left-leaning. Uh, he very often enters the land of snark and derision as it pertains to people who might live prepper-type lifestyles. And yet, he was one of the first people to hit Costco to stock up on toilet paper, paper towels, and disinfectant wipes. Um, I was kind of reminded, I don't know if you remember the... Uh, I think it was a liquid plumber commercial from a couple of years ago that showed people with, uh, you know, the plumber cracks, you know, hanging out of the back of their jeans. And it said something along the lines of, there's a little bit of plumber in all of us. 
<laughs> well, I think with my buddy, he kind of proved that there's a little bit of prepper in all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, as I was saying, I, I never have really considered myself to be a prepper. But as these events over the last couple of weeks have been unfolding, um, and after listening to a podcast by Jack Spierko, um, survival podcast episode 2613, entitled Why Homesteading is One of the Best Preps You Can Make, I have come to believe this. Virtually every homesteader is a prepper, but not every prepper is a homesteader. And here's why I believe that. For some people, prepping is about amassing great quantities of food, water, ammunition, and other supplies, so that in the case of some catastrophic event, you can hunker down and ride out the storm. Homesteaders, on the other hand, aren't just focused on storing up supplies that they can use to survive the event, Rather, they are just as focused on developing skills and systems so that they can live, they can continue to live once the storm has passed. Now, my goal on this podcast isn't to debate the merits of homesteading versus prepping, but the terms are often interchanged, and I think it's important to denote the similarities and differences simply as it pertains to my view of homesteading. And I think it's important because over the next several weeks and months, I think we're going to see a, I don't know if you want to call it a renewed interest or a new interest, new people, more people who are going to be interested in living the homesteading and prepping lifestyles. And, you know, I've seen a, a meme circulating on some of the homestead groups that says something to the effect, and just like that, preppers and homesteaders are being taken seriously. And I do think there's a lot of truth to that. But I think as more people become interested in these lifestyles, I think you're going to see a rise in snake oil salesmen who want to sell shortcuts to preparedness. And already, you know, people are stocking up on food and water and other products. But if all you do is stockpile food, water, and ammunition, eventually that food will either go bad or it'll, it'll expire or it'll it'll run out. Um, now, now, again, I'm not trying to demean that style of prepping. I think for some people that may be the best that they can do. But I do think that learning how to become as self-sufficient, self-reliant, and sustainable as possible, as Jack Spirico put it, is the best prep you can make. And so my goal is really to try to beat that drum as people are kind of, I don't know if you want to say, getting turned on to this or are potentially interested in this lifestyle. I, my, my hope is that people won't try to take the shortcuts, but that they will join us <laughs> on this journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. Because really, I do strongly believe that for the long term, that is the better option. That is the best prep you can make. Now again, I have never thought of myself as a prepper. But as I've had time to reflect on this, especially again in light of all that's taking place uh, in our world, I've really come to understand that I am. First, as people have been panicking over stockpiling food, we haven't. Simply due to the nature of what we do, we have plenty of food stored up. Provided that our electricity continues to flow, our freezers are well stocked. Our pantry is well stocked with vegetables. We have chickens, ducks, and geese that are laying eggs. We can eat the eggs, we can incubate the eggs, we could set broody hens, um, but we have here a, a system that could be very, very uh, sustainable from the standpoint of ducks, chicken, and geese. We have pigs in various stages of growth, and because I have a boar, I can breed more if I need to. We don't need to rely on AI, on semen being shipped in, but again, we have a sustainable system in place um, whereby we can raise pigs. We have seeds to plant uh, a garden. And um, 
you know, we can take that harvest and we can either eat the animal, uh, you know, animals, <laughs> the vegetables fresh, or we can preserve them. So from that standpoint, we are prepared. Now we did go to the store uh, this week and grab a few basic items, things that we can't necessarily produce on our homestead, things like flour and sugar and, and so forth. But we really didn't have to go crazy. And if we wouldn't have been able to get certain things, I wouldn't have panicked. You know, our diet may end up being a bit monotonous, but because by virtue of what we do, we will be just fine. Second, we have a certain skill set um, that leaves us better prepared to face a crisis like this. And quite frankly, I think those skills are invaluable. Now, I have one friend who I would kind of put into the prepper category, but he's somebody who has always been more focused on, at least from my perspective, focused on amassing guns and ammunition than he has been on amassing skills and knowledge. Now, I am not trying to be critical of him. Um, that's what he's chosen to do, and that's his business. But many times he has told me, Brian, when the proverbial crap hits the fan, I want you on my side. Now, I'll tell you, it's not because I am a super tough guy, because I'm not. Uh, it's not that I know uh, that I have tons of money stockpiled, uh, because I don't, or that I have tons of guns and ammunition, you know, enough to start World War III. Uh, that's not how I roll. Um, it, it's because I have a certain skill set. Again, I know how to start seeds and plant a garden. I know how to harvest a garden and preserve it. I know how to harvest animals for meat. As homesteaders, we have developed those skills. We continue to develop those skills as we journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. And so when a crisis like this comes along, we are much better prepared, again, prepper, we are much better prepared to handle the crisis than many other people might be. But you know what else? I'm also a part of a community. And I'm not necessarily talking about a virtual online community, um, although that's great and that's helpful, but if the grid were to go down, then what would I do? I I am very blessed to be a part of a community because I don't know how to do everything. I'm not a beekeeper, but I know people who are. I am not a blacksmith, but I know people who are. I'm not a healthcare professional, but I know people who are. I don't raise beef cows, but I know several people who do. And so because I'm a part of a community of homesteaders, I feel like if things melt down, those people I know will come together and we'll all make it through things just fine. Now, we may be a little worse for wear, but we are certainly better prepared than many people I know. And it's not just because we have all the things or we know all the things, but it's because we have friends and we have family, a community that we're a part of that we can rely on and that we can work with to be able to make it through situations like this. Now, having said all of that, this week I have really done a lot of thinking about our homestead preparedness. And certainly while I think that we are in a better place than most people, I have discovered some holes in our preparedness. Now, folks, maybe it's because I've never been a doomsday prepper. Um, my Level of preparedness certainly doesn't rise to that level. Should it? I don't know. Um, is it possible to be prepared for every possible scenario? I certainly don't think so. But I have found certain weaknesses in our homestead preparedness that I hope to address. Now, some of these things were things that I had already identified. They were already on my list of things that I wanted to get to someday. Um, but you know, I kind of hadn't put a lot of weight or emphasis on it. Well, in light of things that are going on, they become a little bit more important to me. And some of them are, are easy things. Some of them are relatively inexpensive things for me to do. For example, um, I have wanted to do a water catchment system using IBC totes uh, to catch rainwater. Um, that way I would have water for my animals, I would have water for my garden, and I would have water for us to drink if we needed to. 
That's something that's relatively inexpensive that I was hoping to get to someday. Well, I'm going to make that day sooner rather than later. Because I realized that if we were to lose power, uh, I would be in a world of hurt. Now, we don't live that far from the Battenkill River, so I could haul water, but it'd be a bit of a hike. My neighbor has a pond. I probably could get some water from him, but it still would be a pain in the butt to haul that water. Um, it would be much better if I had uh, some totes of water sitting around the homestead. And, and, and even if it, not just that, what if we have a drought? You know, there, there's a lot of things that go through my mind and, and thinking about, okay, what are the things that are absolutely critical to our homestead? And, uh, you know, to me, the level of criticality, you know, it's kind of like, you know, your, your basic needs. I, I need food. I need water, right? And so how can I make sure that I can provide those things to my family and to my animals? And so that's one thing that I have on my list that I've had on my list but it's certainly going to be bumped up a little bit on my list of priorities. Again, not going to cost me a whole lot of money, um, but it's something simple that I can do uh, for our homestead. Another thing that's been on my list um, is to build a root cellar um, so that I can store root crops and squash and so forth. Now, this year, my goal is to grow potatoes in my Ruth Stout garden, and I'm going to need a place to store them long term. Last year, a number of my, well, this winter, a number of the winter squash that I grew last year went bad on me because I didn't have a place to store them properly. Now, to be totally honest, when food is cheap and it's easy to get, losing a few squash to spoilage isn't that big of a deal. But not knowing what's going to happen in the future, well, that squash becomes a lot more valuable. Now, Recently, I've also been having problems with mice getting into my animal feed. And because animal feed is relatively easy for me to get, I've not been as diligent or as quick to address that problem. I'll be addressing that problem this week. And there's a no number of other things, a number of other, whether they're food storage or food preservation things, that I hope to address, whether I'm going to build things or buy things, but things like that, that I, I, I've kind of identified, and there's a number of other things. I, obviously, the list would be I, I could go on and on and on and on forever. But I'm really trying to prioritize things from the standpoint of how easy they are to do, how cheap they are to do, and what the level of criticality is. Um, but again, trying to think through my level of preparedness on my homestead to make sure that we can cover our basic necessities well, for my family and for my animals. Now, those are just a few of the things that I plan to address on our homestead. You may be in a different situation. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to spend some time talking about homestead preparedness. We'll spend some time talking about needs versus wants. We'll, we'll talk about how reducing, reusing, and recycling can and should be a part of our homestead preparedness strategy. And we'll talk some more about the importance of raising and growing our own food. As I said before, I certainly have never thought of myself as a prepper, but as this situation continues to evolve, I really, I found myself at peace. And in part, I think it's because I'm a person of faith. And so in moments of crisis, I lean into that. But also it's because I am blessed to live this lifestyle. And my goal is to help you and to help others like you learn how to be more self-sufficient, self-reliant, and sustainable so that you'll be better prepared to handle situations like this. And so if you have any questions, if you have um, things that you would like me to cover in this series, reach out to me either by, via our Facebook page or our Instagram account, or you can send me an email the Homestead Journey Podcast at gmail.com, and I will be more than happy to answer your questions and try to address the concerns um, that you may have. As we are, you know, we're all in this together. And one of the things that has been, I have found very, very beautiful um, is to see people coming together. Um, restaurants, you know, in our area, a lot of the schools have closed down and there are a number of kids that rely on the schools for 
uh, for lunches and for breakfast and uh, restaurants popping up and saying, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of your kid. No questions asked. We, we got it. Or bus drivers volunteering to deliver meals. Um, you know, people volunteering to, you know, help help their kids. Volunteering to take care of of elderly. Hey, don't go out. We'll get your prescriptions for you. We'll take care of you know whatever you need. We'll get it for you. Um, it's just been beautiful to see that. And um, so uh, all of that to say, uh, as 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 a as a homesteader, my goal is to really try to foster that within the homesteading community and to help us help each other. Um, and that's that's the way we're going to make it through something like this, folks. And uh, I think we'll be fine. And particularly those of us who are living this lifestyle and uh, are really on this journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. Don't panic. We're going to be okay. Um, let's just keep working at it and uh, discover the areas where maybe we've got some holes in our preparedness strategy, and let's work to plug those. So that's what we'll be talking about over the next several weeks. Um, not coronavirus, but really more from a general perspective, homestead preparedness, how we can be ready to handle a crisis like this. All right, folks, thanks again so much for tuning in to this episode of the Homestead Journey podcast. As always, the music on this podcast was provided by audionautics.com, so a big shout out to them. And until next time, folks, keep up the good work.